These days, it's cool to call yourself an entrepreneur, but the real entrepreneurs strive for continuous improvement, innovation, and willing to take risks of detrimental proportions. Join me as we meet the people that are making this happen. One by one, they are sharing the story of their journey as an American entrepreneur. Not everyone can go out and buy a nice GTR and take it out to a drifting track a few times a week. But anyone can go out and get a one-tenth scale GTR drift car and make it look any way they want. This is a hobby that is gaining popularity all over the world. These cars are not about speed, but about gracefully gliding along a track in unison with other cars. These cars are assembled and painted with as much realism as possible. So real that if you took a picture of one, it would almost be indistinguishable from a real car. The technology and designs are also getting highly advanced with all its related accessories. We're going to meet a gentleman that has decided to bring this hobby to Dallas, Texas. He opened an indoor track with a related retail shop selling the latest gear. So come on and join me. I think you'd really enjoy hearing his entrepreneurial journey story. Hey. Hey Steve, how's it going? Good, morning. Let me show you around a little bit. Alright. So uh, this is uh, Drift America RC. This is our facility. We have uh, this is, we do all our rear wheel drive RC drifting here, and uh, we have three main areas. Uh, the shop, uh, which is, you know, where we sell everything you need to set up an RC drift car or to maintain your existing one or upgrade it. Uh, we have the pit area in here. Uh, this is where everybody works on their cars. We actually spend more time in here than on the track, but uh, yeah, this is... We've got 25 workstations in here for people to uh, wrench on their car, build. We let people, you know, paint their cars here. And then this is our track. Uh, this is where everybody drives the cars. And um, it's a special surface made for rear wheel drive drifting. Uh, super slick, slippery. We've got scale accessories. Um, nice ambiance. We've got an area for drivers to sit and kind of immerse yourself into the experience of drifting. Uh, we have a scale RC garage where people can uh, take pictures of their cars to show everybody on Facebook that they were here. And, uh, and then make them guess, is it a real car and garage or yeah, not? Yeah, we try to keep it <laughs> as realistic looking as we can. Uh, we do also do fingerboarding here, so we have plazas set up around the track. Uh, some of these are uh, imported and some of these are made right here by uh, Good Vibes Fingerboarding. And uh, this one's all marble. We, uh, we do have the fingerboards for sale here too. Um, it's uh, good, goodvibesfingerboarding.com is where he sells all the fingerboards. And uh, we have a, a paint booth in here where we paint everything and then there's a little rock crawling course outside as well. This is your paint booth right here? Uh, no, actually the paint booth is up here. This is the paint booth. Oh, okay. Let's see. <laughs> you can catch a little sneak peek in there. So um, is this paint booth open to people that buy a body or is that what yeah, you do? Yeah, anybody that comes in here, uh, you know, pays a track fee or is a member can paint a body up here and uh, I'll help them do it. Give them as much advice as I can. And the beautiful skyline, Dallas, Texas. Thank you. The first thing we painted, the neighbors drove through the wall not too long ago. <laughs> oh, that's great. So we had to patch it up with the American flag. Yeah, we, uh, we, we get a lot of people in here. We've had events, uh, I would say about 70 people before. We've got to have about up to 30 people on the track at one time driving. Uh, we've had events where we pick up the whole track and put 15 fingerboard plazas in here just for people to do the fingerboarding all day. Uh, and, uh, the, the pit area gets pretty full. We really maximize the space, uh, but we all uh, 
work it out. It's rare that there's ever actually 25 people in here. Sometimes we get like eight over here and eight over here. But as long as everybody's seated, people can get up and walk around. We do all rear wheel drive, so uh, no all wheel drive is significantly different. You have a lot more control, the speeds are a lot more scale. Uh, let me show you in the shop a little bit about, you know, kind of what you need to get started. Um, so What's the demographic of the people that do this, just real quick? Usually like, uh, I would say 25 to 35 male. Uh, some, some, you know, 40 and up come in, but mostly, you know, with their, with their kids, you know, trying to have some father-son time. Uh, so when people come in for their first time, I usually ask them if they're familiar with RC at all. Uh, if the answer is yes, then I can skip a lot. But if the answer is no, I kind of break it down. Um, you basically, you have a radio, and the radio has two channels. Uh, channel 1, uh, positive 10, negative 10, and channel 2, positive 10, negative 10. Uh, channel 1 to turn and 2 to burn. So channel 1 controls your steering servo right and left and channel 2 controls your speed control forward and backward. Um, so the radio connects to a receiver and the receiver transfers those channels, channel 1 to your steering servo which steers the car right and left and channel 2 to your speed control which uh, controls the motor forward or backward or brake. Uh, so channel two goes to an electronic speed control. These have uh, like a built-in chip that gives you a lot of different options. You know, it gives you like turbo, uh, overall boost, braking power, uh, throttle curve, bunch bunch of different options, all electronic. Um, so when you get a car, you basically you need a rolling chassis, uh, speed control and motor. Sometimes they have in a combo. Um, your servo, which is uh, it's a little box that steers the car. Let's see if I have one in here. Actually. This is actually our rental. It's going to eat up. But um, yeah, so this is the steering servo, and you see the little arm in there turning right and left when it turns. This is the gyro that actually controls. It makes the car kind of do this when you're driving it. It automatically steers for you. Um, and then, uh, so you need a speed control motor, a servo, a gyro, a radio with a receiver, and a battery, and then of course the chassis. So there are some ready to run kits like this one. Uh, this one comes ready to run out of the box. You can take it out of the box and start driving it, charge your batteries and keep going. Uh, this is a Yokomo ready to run. Actually comes with a body, it's just under $400. And, uh, Something like this you can get just to get on the track and see if you like it enough to, you know, upgrade, get something. Uh, this is actually a good chassis because it's really upgradable. Uh, there are a lot of parts available for it, a lot of conversions. It's a YD2 chassis. Um, another option when people come in their first time, you know, we do this a lot. Uh, it's basically this kit right here. Um, so you get the, the kit that you build. And, you know, it comes with the instructions, you put it all together, build the dampers, everything. It took me about eight hours to build one. So it's a, it's a project. And then you need uh, your speed control and motor. This is what we usually give for a starter chassis. Um, radio. And we do Sanwa servos. And uh, we actually have these little Eagle racing gyros that are, you know, inexpensive and they work well, pretty easy to use, all manually controlled. Um, so a, a combo like this is about $600. Uh, you build it, you put it together, you tune it, you set up all the electronics yourself. Whereas this one, you know, it comes already built, but to me, it kind of robs the hobby of its, uh, of its thrill and its, uh, process. So, Actually, for, for someone that's younger to build an RC car like this, it teaches you a lot. It teaches, you know, mechanics, physics, following directions, electronics, uh, you know, building using tools, you know, pilot holes for screws, using thread locker, 
uh, building a diff. Uh, actually, the first step in this kit is to build a planetary gear diff. So uh, it teaches kids a lot. I, I built my first uh, RC car when I was 13. It wasn't a drift car, obviously, but um, I feel like it, it taught me a lot uh, early in life about general mechanics. Um, but just like a lot of people don't want to put a bicycle together. I guess you'll put it together for people if you want, for yeah, a fee, we, I guess. We do offer, so like to, to build this kit, we build it for $50, and then we can install all the electronics and give it a basic tune for another $50. Um, so that, that that is an option. And, you know, the bodies, so the, the bodies, painting the bodies is a whole other aspect of the hobby. Like there's the driving, and then there's the building, and then there's the painting. So the, the painting really... Um, you can take any of these clear shells and cut them out, paint them from the inside, any color you want. And uh, you saw some of the bodies I've done. I mean, there, there are a lot of different ways you can do it. This is a pretty basic uh, paint job. So I, I do do paint jobs. Uh, if someone comes in and wants to buy a body and have me paint it, I'll paint it for $100. But well, how can, elaborate would that $100 get you? Something like this, you know, good clean trim lines and... But what if I wanted something just totally out there with a lot of graphics and just something that was just Most really killer? Most graphics I could do for $40. Okay. Um, the GTR you saw out there, that one's pretty elaborate, so I'd probably charge a little more for that, to be honest. It's it's a lot of work. Oh, I know. Because you, you know. get to reverse. you got to do it from the inside out. Yeah, not just that, but all the little cutting and right, the yeah. fine lines and stuff. It becomes to be a lot. Um, and I guess the object of the game, too, is having... A car that, if you took a picture of it, it's indistinguishable from a real car. Yeah, you want it to look realistic. And then, you know, once I paint the body, uh, you know, you can get an exhaust pipe for it and uh, put that down there. And then, you know, we have light kits to put headlights in it. This one, we actually have pop-up headlights for. You can buy those and put them in yourself. You know, uh, gas tank lids, side mirrors. Um intercoolers there are a lot of accessories you can do and then you know people put stickers on the back windows we have you know slap sets that you can get but yeah you can do all that you can do full interiors uh this is pretty cool they have uh i just put one of these on a car so it's the full inner fender kit and interior with the seats and the uh okay uh, that's really cool you know the air filter and well this kit right here if I was to buy this kit, how upgradable is it? Could it take me probably as high as I wanted to go or would I ever have to abandon this one and start over? So what's cool about this kit, uh, this is so this is the D5MR mid-motor. And they, they, they had before the D5RR, which was rear motor. And the big difference is that this bulkhead, the whole piece down here flips around. And then there's a low motor mount for it. And then you just need a different upper plate. So uh, this this chassis is very dynamic. You can change around the motor position. Um, there are a lot of upgrades. The actual the, the three racing upgrades are great. You know they have you know full aluminum parts, uh, and they're fairly inexpensive for what they are. To go uh, full aluminum on a kit like this would probably be about two or three hundred dollars. So yeah, there are a lot of upgrades and you know, some of the parts like the arms, you can really use just about any brand for arms, uh, upper, lower arms and knuckles. Uh, dampers, you can use any brand. Um, those are the shocks? Mm -hmm. Do those shocks actually have any kind of fluid in them? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We, the, actually, damper building is a really important aspect uh, of RC drifting. Good, I'm glad because I thought when I asked that question that might would have been a really dumb question. They're, they're oil filled and um, I mean I, I have titanium uh, shock shafts here. We, we use different O-rings. Some people are really particular about the O-rings they put. Uh, Do you fill it with actual hydraulic fluid? It's a uh, shock Some? oil. Yeah, this is 250. Uh, okay. Uh, 20, I think it's 25 weight. Um, a lot of people use 10 weight, which we're out of stock on. The, uh, there are a lot of different softnesses of springs. This is a spring set. Uh, so yeah. Bring that over here. I want to see it just kind of the, in front of the camera here. Yeah, The sure. spring set. The dampers oh, okay. are definitely a really important part uh, of, of driving. And then once you get the dampers on, you want to set your ride height so that the, the chassis is balanced to drive. 
Um, so yeah, I mean this this is you know kind of our intro level kit. You can uh, purchase uh, additional stuff, or you can you know I can paint a body for you, or you can paint the body yourself. Pick out the wheels and tires you want. Um, you know, build it, accessorize, put whatever upgrades, change things out, tune it differently. Some people, when they tune their car and they get it driving the way they like it, they leave it. Other people like to constantly tune and change things and see what different things feel different. Um, so uh, I, I'm more of a, once I get it tuned, I like to leave it alone, but some people are constantly changing things. And every time you add a part or change a part, you have to really retune everything all over again. So. It's a, it's a project in itself every time when you add something. But, uh, okay. yeah, I hope, hope that helps figure out, you know, if anybody's wanting to get into the hobby, what you need, you know, it's uh, it's not an inexpensive hobby to get into. Once you get your car running, really all you need to pay for is charging your battery. Introduce yourself and tell us about your business. Uh, okay, um, my name is Stephen Platt, and uh, I have a business uh, selling RC drift cars. How did you get into this drift car overall? Uh, well, honestly, I was watching a, a drift video like most people get into it, and uh, I was talking to my uh, wife, and I said, uh, you know, let's learn how to do this and started trying to figure out how to do it. And it's a lot more complicated than I thought. And uh, I got hooked up with some guys that were meeting up in garages and uh, you know, having little drift sessions and started to really enjoy doing that and figured out how to set up my car and got the right, you know, equipment that I needed and started to realize that nobody knows how to do this. And the, uh, the, the, the parts and uh, the information just uh, aren't available in the US. It was mostly overseas. So I decided to start a group um, with a mission to bring RC drifting to America. Um, it was already kind of trickling in, um, but uh, there definitely needed to be an organization or some kind of an effort you know, to bring it in. So I started uh, Drift America, RC Drift Movement, and it's a movement to bring RC drifting to America. When did you start this business? <clears throat> well, before I started the actual business, we uh, we had a Facebook group page. Um, and uh, actually, even just before that, we were uh, having meets in you know, my garage and uh, uh, putting out instructional videos on YouTube. Uh, just just trying to uh, help you know give the RC drift community a little bit of a leg up what year was this I would say about 2013 2013 so uh, actually initially my goal was to import uh, RC drift products uh, you know chassis uh, electronics bodies wheels tires um, and sell them to hobby shops and take a, a commission for it and basically just import and uh, distribute. Um, but no, none of the hobby shops really wanted to get on board. Uh, in fact, there were only two hobby shops that did get on board and uh, they bought some stuff and uh, one of them didn't sell any of it and ended up asking me to, uh, you know, come pick it up and give his money back, which I did, you know, and that's kind of when I realized, you know, someone's gonna have to really step up and, um, so uh, I uh, leased this space and uh, it, it was kind of a hard sell. We're more of like a destination. So, if, you know, people drive pretty far to come here. Um, and I mean, it doesn't matter if we're here, you know, 30 minutes north, 30 minutes east, west, people are gonna show up, you know, and we don't need a retail location. So I was just looking for a uh, air conditioned uh, warehouse or an office warehouse and, uh, so, you know, we found this space. What year was it that you moved into this location? Uh, 
about 2015. If I'm, if I'm not so mistaken, from maybe 2013 to 15, you were meeting in garages, building up a good following, good camaraderie, good good yeah. group of guys that were into this. And, and, and I, I should mention, we, we did car shows. Um, so uh, when people have car shows, they just have this huge space and obviously they need to delegate the space, but you know, asking for 30 by 40 spot isn't a lot to ask and it actually brings a lot to the car show. Um, so they're happy to have you do it. Uh, we just, uh, we said, you know, we need a local track for the hobby to really grow. And uh, so that's why we moved in here. Exactly. What is this drifting? I know it's not about speed. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that a little bit? Um, drifting is real, you know, I would say slow paced. It's uh, it's more of a dance. It's more of a uh, kind of a slow movement. Um, I was it, talking to a couple of guys about it and they were telling me it's just, it's very relaxing. Yeah, it's, uh, it is, it, it's got a, a very peaceful feel to it. It's, it's a balancing act. It's, it's kind of like trying to balance a broom on your hand. Um, you know, you, you don't want to give it too much throttle cause you'll spin out. Um, you don't want to oversteer it cause you'll spin out. Um, it, it's, it's, once you get the motion down and you can peacefully move through the curves on the track, it's kind of like water passing over you. It's, it's a real, you know, feng shui kind of Zen feeling. Um, and when you get someone going with you and you're in unison or, or even a group of, you know, eight guys or you know, eight cars, just, just flowing through the track and just, uh, you know, moving along and just got the rhythm down. And it's, it's a very relaxing, uh, uh, peaceful feeling. So. What were you doing before you started this business? <clears throat> I had a tanning salon uh, for about eight years and uh, I enjoyed it. I, I worked at tanning salons a lot throughout my life. Um, it, was a, it was a good business because you really are selling, I mean, UV light uh, promotes a lot of serotonin production and um, so you're really selling sunshine. So I enjoyed doing that. Um, but uh, after a while, it, it uh, you know, I opened that business with my girlfriend and, you know, uh, we had it, we got married and had a kid and that turned out to, uh, you know, that was great. And then shortly after, you know, she decided to go her separate way. And so I was running the business on my own and I decided that, you know, on my own, it wasn't really what I wanted to do. So you were looking for other opportunities or other kinds of, what yeah. kind of other businesses were you looking at? You know, I, I don't want to say it was a, like a midlife crisis kind of decision. It was, it was definitely something like, I want to do something for me now, something that I enjoy. And it, I guess it's a weird thing to be passionate about, but I am passionate about it. I, uh, I really have a lot of, uh, I have a lot of faith that this is going to become a really big, uh, hobby for America. It already is. Um, it's, it's grown a lot. Um, but I just think it's so cool. I mean, I've, I've been in car, I've been into cars since I was a kid and, uh, you can take any, well, not any car, but just about any popular car, someone makes the body for it. And you can take that body and, you know, say you, you saw, uh, a purple Lamborghini but you think it would look better as a GTR, you know, so you can do that same paint scheme, but on a GTR, maybe change some colors a little bit, mix in another paint scheme that you saw and then uh, put blue underglow and, um, you know, put the exhaust tips that you like on it, put a sunroof in there, you know, do full interior, you know, engine swap it with a, you know, LS, whatever, V8. Um, you can do any of that stuff with it, you know, and then just make it your own project and uh, then make it look as real as you can to where people can't tell the difference in pictures of, you know, between whether it's real or RC and uh, actually drive it on the track where we've got a lot of scale scenery and get pictures of it where it looks like it's actually driving by a curb with bushes on it or a fence. And um, you can really immerse yourself in the experience while you're driving it. Um, and you don't have to go out and buy a whole GTR and get it wrapped. And, you know, it's, it's, uh, you end up, I mean, 
you still spend some money and you spend a lot of time on it, but it's, it's yours. It's something that you created. It's artistic. It's creative. Um, it's an outlet. And, you know, while you're doing it, it's actually, you know, super relaxing, super peaceful. It's, you know, you focus your energy on something other than the world. And, uh, you, you know, you're, you're, you're having some, uh, unwinding time. What are your revenue sources for this business? Uh, well, so, you know, we obviously, we have a, we have inventory that we sell and, you know, we mark up the inventory from wholesale. We do have labor, uh, uh, charges, um, like, like painting bodies. I paint bodies for a hundred dollars. Uh, we install electronics for 50, uh, we'll build a chassis for 50. Um, I'll put a, uh, a light kit in a car for forty dollars. I mean, just there's there's things that we do as you know labor, uh, labor fees, um, and then just general tuning is twenty bucks an hour. Uh, we have rental chassis, um, and that we charge forty dollars an hour. We'll, usually, people do a half hour for twenty, and uh, then uh, we have a track fee. We we charge uh, the people come in to use the track. It's fifteen dollars a day. And then we also offer a membership for $60 a month. And uh, so if someone's going to come in at least four times a week at, or a month, it makes sense to have um, the membership for 60 instead of paying you know, 15 each time. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we do have that uh, revenue also. And that the daily fee and the track fee, that includes usage of the the uh, pit area as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, you know, fingerboarding driving on the track or using the pit area. Um, I mean, some people that, you know, come up here don't really have a car. They just come up here to hang out with their friends or whatever. And that's, you still charge a track fee for that. You know, it's like everybody that comes in here um, needs to support the track and keep it open. So what time do you normally close? Uh, oof. I, I try to get out of here around 930 every night. What if uh, someone walk in here at six o'clock? They got off work. You, do, do they still have to pay the whole track fee oh, for yeah. that day? Yeah. Okay, I didn't know if it... Yeah. And then if, you know, and that's where the membership's good to have because some people come in just for like 10 minutes between jobs or something and they have memberships so they don't have to worry about having paid $15 for 10 minutes or whatever. But someone might come in and only stay for 30 minutes and pay a $15 track fee, but then maybe the next time they'll come in and stay all day and only pay $15. There are some uh, RC drift tracks around the country, around the world, that I think do charge hourly. And I don't it's like that. It's hard to keep up with, isn't it? Well, it's hard to keep up with, but also it makes people feel like they're like on a time crunch to get out of here, you know? And um, I, I like for people to feel like they can, you know, stay until we close. And I even sometimes let people stay later. Um, like, you know, people that have been coming here for a while and know kind of how to close up and lock the door behind them. When putting together your track, what are some of the things that you consider that's really makes or breaks a track? The surface, very important. Um, you want to have, you know, smooth, polished concrete, I, I think optimally. Some people, you know, start with carpet. We ground this down to bare concrete and then, uh, and it was, it was a lot to grind down. We were here for a while. Um, it was like four coats of uh, epoxy paint. And, uh, but yeah, we polished it. Down. We got it down to bare concrete and then put a urethane coat on it and polished it really good. Uh, you want to have either like kind of a square or a rectangle shape. This is, this is a little bit offset and it uh, ended up not allowing us to really maximize this, the space that we have. Um, you want to have a, a pit area. Um, we probably spend more time in the pit area than on the actual track. And then obviously you want a little space for a shop. Well, as far as the track goes, I've noticed that you've got these curbs and I guess you, you make them to scale the, the, the height to match the cars. You've got these fences, you've got the light poles. How did you come up with that? Yeah, well, we decided on a, a, a 30 inch wide lane, but uh, the lane is marked. So a lot of the lanes there's actually space outside of the lane to run off of before there's an actual curb that you hit. Um, 
But uh, in general, it seems like every track layout turns into a lima bean somehow. Uh, it's the, you know, a lima bean shape or asymmetrical lima bean shape. Um, but uh, there are a lot of, you know, track layouts. Uh, there's kind of the S shape. Um, there are actual drift tracks all over the world that you can you know, kind of mimic the bee suit. Uh, from what I understand, they have several tracks uh, there. Um, but, you know, a lot of the times you just kind of drive and see what kind of flow feels good and start piecing it together with the, uh, with the track pieces that you have. Um, teardrop shapes are nice to have. Uh, lots of straights. Um, there's something called a manji. Uh, it's, it's where you, you come out of a turn and you kind of rock the car this way and then back the other way again. Um, so it's like a, like a weight shift. Do you have that here? Yeah, every, every straight. So you come out of the right turn here. here and then you switch back a little manji and then you switch back into the next turn. Um, and the longer the straight is, the more speed you can get up before the manji um, and kind of flick it into the next turn. Is this the original track layout when you opened the business? No, we, we changed. changed the layout at least once every six months. Really? Once every six months? Completely change it out, huh? Yeah. Do uh, so you ever have some tracks that just don't really work out that good? You go, Damn, I kind of wish I would do that. And they yeah. complain, your, your members kind of complain. So they give you some feedback. Maybe let's call it. Well, we usually won't, when we lay out the track, we don't spend a whole lot of time decorating it. We just kind of let it, let it fly for a you know, week or so and just see how everybody likes it. And, I've had times where I, I thought I had a good idea and it wasn't good, so we completely ripped it up and just redid it. Um, we actually had an intersection right here for a while that was pretty cool. Until they started hitting each other, huh? No, no one hit Not each really. other. No, it was it was it was kind of a clover shape, um, and uh, there was a, a, a four so a four lane intersection in between, and uh, yeah, it was really cool because you could run the layout like. You know 20 different ways and people would pick a, a path to follow along and um we, we tried to get some good crossover footage of people weaving through each other and stuff and so it was it was interesting um that was a fun layout but yeah it, it, you, there are all different kinds of layouts you can pick um you want to have some interesting uh spots some tight turns some good straights some big you always want at least one big sweeper uh that's like one long 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 wide so drift that, that nice. you can just hold the angle for a long time yeah we actually had one that started in the middle you see one like this and it spiraled all the way around and you can just keep going all the way around to the back and then come back through so, yeah you definitely want a big sweeper when you started this business, what are some things that really caught you by surprise that you had no idea about, but you learned after you opened up? You know, uh, and you know, I wanted to mention this in this in this interview. I want you, no matter what. Uh, so, if, if you're passionate about something, um, say it's you know painting uh, landscapes for people, or you know whatever for yourself. Um, if it's something new and kind of progressive, even more so, um, if you're really into it and you're really passionate about it, chances are there are other people that are into it and passionate about it, and they will pay to come be into it and passionate about it with you in a place that is designed to help support that, whatever you're passionate about. Um, and just having that little bit of faith and figuring out how to monetize it I mean, uh, people like coming here, you know, we have a good atmosphere, um, good, good, uh, you know, mood, good, uh, people, uh, and, uh, you know, people will pay to come be a part of it, you know, hence the, the track fee, you know, and some people pay a track fee and they're not even driving a car. Um, and, and just having that kind of support for the uh, community, um, and, people being more than happy to support it. That's what surprised me um, is, uh, you know, really just, and it's not just RC drifting is, is what I'm trying to say is no matter what people are passionate about, they're not the only one. They could be passionate about collecting dolls and you could 
open a doll shop, you know, and, and find other Are people. Are you thinking about couldn't. getting into dolls? No, I'm just kidding. Ah, <laughs> um, oh, no, I'm giving you Well, we, are, we kind of are into dolls. We have we have uh, scale garages, which are basically yeah, wanna, we're gonna doll show houses that for well. men. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> they probably have scale snap-on tools in, in your garage, too. There are right? scale snap-on. <laughs> yeah, snap-on actually has a whole selection of one-tenth scale stuff that it's expensive. What a big mistake you made that you thought, oh, wait a minute, I can't do that, so I got to shift over and do this. Hmm. That's a tough question. I don't make mistakes, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, what mistake have I... <sighs> well, I mean, for example, your space. Obviously, the biggest part is going to be the track. Mm -hmm. You've got your retail part. You've got your pit area. Is there, do you wish maybe you got into a bigger oh, space maybe? Maybe you had no, a bigger can, retail area, I mean. I can think of a good mistake. Um, so people are people and uh, sometimes you, you run across people that are just negative. They just wanna um, shoot it down, you know, complain um, and uh, I made the mistake of listening to one of those people and, uh, you know, be open to like, so going back to dolls, maybe, you know, you start a, a place for dolls and you're into the little frilly, you know, 15th century, whatever, I don't know, dolls. Um, and, uh, all of a sudden someone's coming in and they're saying, Hey, we should start collecting Iron Man figures. Cause you know, they're really cool too, you know? And so, Maybe we should start collecting, you know, Marvel and DC action figures as well as dolls, you know? And uh, then someone says, don't, can't have two kinds of dolls under one place. That's not going to work. You can't do it, you know? Um, and you listen to them. You're like, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, I'm so, or they're like, I'm not coming there anymore if you're going to sell Iron Man, you know? And um, let that person stop coming, you know, embrace, you know, uh, a little bit of uh, diversifying um, some additional, you know, types of people that might want to come and, you know, who, who knows, maybe they'll be into the, you know, 18th century dolls too, at some point, or maybe some of your doll collectors from the you know, 18th century stuff will like start wanting to get Iron Man figures. Well, for translate that into the, these cars though. <clears throat> That's kind of where you're losing me. Okay. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, yeah, no, I you're talking about the dolls, that. you're talking I'm about the dolls, to... but can you translate yes. that into this, the cars? Like, were there people well, about nothing but speed I don't and not wanna, drifting? Maybe? I don't want to call anybody out. Well, we, uh, just, just... we, we had uh, a, a, a guy that came up here with a fingerboard one day and uh, he was like, oh, check it out. You can do little tricks on it. And people were like, oh, wow, you know, you can put the fingerboard on the car and it's actually the right scale. And it looks like a, like someone's fingerboarding next to the car. Fingerboard's a scale skateboard. It's a, yeah, it's a 10th scale skateboard that people use their fingers. And, uh, you know, we would have like a car drifting by and someone would jump it with a, with a skateboard, you know, and um, it kind of worked together. And then, you know, people started bringing fingerboards up here and, uh, you know, uh, they were doing it on the on the tables and the pits, and uh, a couple of the drivers were like, "That's annoying. You know, you can't can't have two hobbies under one roof. We're not gonna fingerboarders are not cool or whatever. We're not gonna come there anymore." And so, uh, you know, we were no more fingerboarding. You know, well, that was a mistake. You know, um, we should have embraced that from the beginning. You know, that was something cool that came in that you know. Um, and we have embraced it since, and it's become a, a, a really popular hobby. And now we have, you know, several big fingerboard plazas around the, the track and people come up here just to fingerboard, you know, and they, um, they actually generate track fees for us. And, uh, does it cost money to come here or membership to come here and fingerboard? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same as a track. Fee. Oh, same yeah. as a track. Yeah. Fee. Plaza fee. yeah. If someone came in here, bought a car, that's never done this drifting before. Do you also offer, lessons i usually try to give someone kind of a basic lesson but at the end of the day you really just, just got to drive it, it. you got to drive and get the hang of it and i've seen people come in here that just could not drive at all and they've they spend a lot of time they're up here every day and you know come in 
you know, after work and spend an hour or two on the track. You know, they try to be here when there's not a lot of cars here, so they're not in anybody's way or wrecking into everybody. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it's 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 fun to do. It's it's enjoyable. It's relaxing. It's not a frustrating thing because um, you're really just kind of letting go and you're letting the car drive itself. Um, once once the car is set up right, you know, you're just you're giving a little bit of guidance around the track. Um, and a lot of people really enjoy doing it. So learning to drive is actually, you know, fun to do. Um, but I always give, you know, people some initial pointers and ways to think so that they're at least going down the right path, you know? What What are some pieces of advice you'd give someone that wanted to start a business like this or any kind of business? Something that you've really learned that's helped you? Some people have, uh, some distributors have intro uh, purchases that they require, but they say they require it, but they'll take a $500 order. Just say, hey, I'm just starting out, you know, and just get some inventory. And once you have some inventory, just make sure you buy stuff you know you're gonna sell. When you're starting a business and you initially go to a distributor and you make your first inventory purchase, just make sure you're buying all stuff that you know you'll sell. Don't buy stuff that, that you, you want. like. Right. Well, yeah, not just stuff that you want though. Think about what other people, just, you wanna sell it. You don't wanna right. keep it for yourself, you wanna sell it. So you know, make your first purchase stuff you know you'll sell and then get your inventory, um, get it sold as fast as you can. How did you come up with the name of your business? The name? Uh, well, I wanted something really broad and <laughs> something so uh, here's the thing there, there was a group on Facebook where um, it was people all over the world uh, and and you got a lot of people from Japan a lot of people from you know Australia Hawaii you know just um, posting you know drift videos well I wanted those people to see how the, the drift the RC drift community is growing in America so uh, it, it's Drift America, not for Americans, but for everybody else in the world. Um, I want people to see what American RC drifting looks like. Um, and uh, that's why, you know, I've got the real patriotic American flag in the logo. And well, think about it. When you see a big, like a Japanese flag, you know, you know, oh, Japan, that's kind of cool. I like J Japanese stuff, you know? Um, so it's, it's kind of that same, uh, the same premise. Um, that's, that's how I came up with the name Drift America. Now, Drift America RC, the acronym is DARC, D-A-R-C, and uh, that's actually uh, taken a life of itself. Um, this is actually called the track is dark circuit. And when people say they're going to dark, they just say I'm going dark. Um, when you look on the map, it just says dark. Um, so it's, it's got kind of a cool acronym and that, um, that was unintended, but I knew it was there when I first started it, and I didn't know if it would take off or not, but it's kind of a cool acronym. Where do you see this business three to five years from now? Or five to seven years from now? I mean, it's it's growing uh, pretty rapidly. Well, California's grown a lot, you know, in the RC Drift community. There are a lot of tracks in California now. Um, there are a lot of people doing it, um, but we're starting to see you know, a, a, a growth in Dallas that's equal to what's been going on in California. So California RC drift shops are doing really well. Um, and there's some of them that, you know, I, I actually admire and, and, you know, try to model our business after, you know, we, we have our own um, personality for sure, you know, but I would like to achieve the success that some of the places in California have achieved so far. And uh, so in three to five years, I hope to be somewhere near where they are today, you know. Um, is there a lot of competition around here in Dallas, Fort Worth, at this drifting? No, uh, we're the only RC drift track um, in Dallas. It's a weird hobby because it's hard to tune your car and know how to tune it. And then once your car is tuned, it's hard to learn to drive it, but you can't really tune it if you don't know how to drive it. So you really need help. You really just need a community that knows what they're doing to give you advice and kind of give you a little bit along the way. Um, and that's what we have that nobody else has um, in, in Dallas. You, you can uh, get your own community growing without an actual space to do it. And um, it, it's possible. What, 
as far as seasonality, I guess during the wintertime when you can't go outside, you probably get really busy. Is that site to site or it doesn't it's matter? Been, uh, it's been like 110 degrees here over the last you right, know, yeah. month or two, and it hasn't been terribly busy. Uh, it's, it's actually been a slow month. Um, so I'm thinking if it is seasonal that, you know, I mean, people just don't even want to get in their car right now. Oh, that's fine. Don't get, want to go anywhere anywhere other than where you have to. So maybe that's- uh, well, How about in wintertime? Does it get pretty busy in the winter? I mean, it, it's been, you know, it hasn't seemed seasonal. It's been pretty consistent. I mean, we probably get a little bit of a boost when people get their tax returns. And... Tell us about, you said that you were open for a while and during COVID you ended up shutting down. Then you came back. Yeah. Uh, so, we, uh, and didn't COVID actually make hobby business really even get more popular across yeah, the board? So they, they said that you can't gather uh, for a while during COVID. So people really couldn't come to the track and um, it was like against the law or whatever, I guess, to gather. And uh, so uh, that that had a, an effect on the, the attendance for the track. Um, and then that's really when the whole thing with the fingerboarding happened. And, uh, you know, when I talked about the mistake I made by listening to the, mm -hmm. um, negative energy that was being brought into the, the, the hobby growing actually. Um, and, uh, so, uh, I actually closed the doors for a while and how uh, long is a while about a year. Oh, for a whole year. Yeah. We were actually looking for another space. And I was like, I wonder if that one's still available. And uh, we came here and it was, and I, I talked to him. His name is Al. And I said, hey, you know, we uh, think we want to, you know, take another go at it, you know. And uh, I, I think that, you know, uh, we have a better plan this time. We have some things we're going to do differently. And he said, well, you know, I don't think you would, you know, come to me and say, I want to reopen if you don't plan on paying rent. So, you know, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have you back, you know? And so, uh, I did the same thing, you know, uh, put down the deposit and, uh, you know, moved in here. Everything was actually a lot of the ways we left it, you know, there's still posters on the wall and stuff. And, um, who'd rather rent it out than leave it vacant any longer. Too, yeah. I mean, so. it sat here on un unleashed for a year. Um, so uh, anyway, and that's when we reopened, we said, you know what, we're, we are embracing the fingerboarding. You know, we're gonna um, not look at it as a bad thing, but instead give it a chance to grow and it has. By the way, is the fingerboarding popular at other tracks as well? Or you're the only one that does this? Yes. And so it's funny because fingerboarders make their own videos and people watch the fingerboarding videos and they're like, yo, did an RC drift car just slide by in the background, you know, and they're just like, <laughs> so it's kind of a marketing, yeah, sort of a marketing it's, concept. It's, it's for something you as well, that in the and a place for them to come gather. Yeah. In the fingerboarding world, they know that this is the only RC uh, fingerboard track or fingerboard area with an RC drift track at it, you know, so it's, it's kind of unique in the fingerboarding world because of that too. But we're also unique in the RC drift world because we have the fingerboards and, uh, so, you know, people want to, you know, bring that to their tracks too. You know, that's something that's kind of in the works too. Well, tell us about your marketing efforts. How do you do marketing? As you just covered one of them, by the way, by having fingerboarding here, because mm -hmm. you got the fingerboard enthusiasts coming here that may get interested in actually getting into the drift cars. So what are some of your marketing tactics? Well, uh, so, you know, Good Vibes Fingerboarding is, is the name of the, the, the group that does the fingerboarding and uh, they they do make a lot of videos and they always, you know, talk about, uh, you know, where they're located and, um, you know, that this is the home of Good Vibes. And uh, so that is definitely good marketing, uh, social media, you know, word of mouth. Um, I try to put our logo on everything that we put out, you know, uh, when we have events, we take pictures and I put the logo on every picture. And then when people take their pictures of their car from the event, they post it on their page or they'll make it their profile picture. And then you can see Drift America. 
Um, Tell us about the event. What you, when you say events, what are these events? Well, the main event we do is it's our Matsuri, uh, which is it just it means like a drift festival, um, and we have it twice a year. We have a fall and a spring Matsuri. Is it here? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. If you went somewhere. Yeah, and uh, it's it's just a, a a celebration of the growth of the RC drift hobby that we have twice a year, and uh, we change the track layout shortly before it. Um, and uh, we invite, you know, usually people come from all over Texas, uh, sometimes people from California or Missouri. I've had people come down from Jersey for our Matsuri. When we first started having our Matsuri, we were one of the only tracks in the country, you know, so people would drive pretty far to go to a track, but now there are tracks in other parts of the country and so they don't have to drive as far. Uh, but we still have people come visit a lot. Um, so we have our Matsuri. Uh, so we do car shows still. Uh, we had one at Texas Motor Speedway, uh, I guess about a month and a half, two months ago now. Uh, we have one coming up at Dallas Market Hall, Hot Import Nights. We've been doing Hot Import Nights for several years. I think we've done it four times now. And uh, we go set up a track there and everybody shows up and drives cars and we have a good time. Um, other events that we have here, uh, we have our OG session where uh, we just invite people that haven't been here for a while to come back and uh, we, we do uh, drift games. We don't have any like competitions per se, but just kind of goofy games. Like uh, we have a parallel parking competition, I guess. And, um, we uh, do drift limbo where you try to drift as close to the wall as you can without hitting it. And we keep adding a cone every time you come through the sweeper. Uh, we do uh, last man standing where just everybody goes around the track. And if you hit something, you get off the track. Um, or if you hit another driver, you get off the track. Uh, and then at the end of the, the, end of the uh, game, the last person standing wins or whatever. Um, we do do body competitions. I haven't done one in a while, but um, we encourage people to you know, paint bodies and do a good job. And, you know, so we kind of score them. I have like a judging system that I use. Um, yeah, some of these paint jobs are really elaborate. I'm yeah. really impressed with some of them. People spend a lot of time and energy <clears throat> on them. Um, so it, it's cool to reward people when, uh, when they do, or to give people a reason to build something for, you know, that event. Uh, we, we used to have actual competitions, which the competitions, uh, it, it's, two people driving in tandem. You have one lead and one follow, and uh, they go one lap, and then they switch places, and then this person leaves and this one follows, and they try to go together the whole time. And then there's a panel of judges, and they just judge who led best and who followed best. And uh, that person goes up in the bracket. So if you have 20 people competing, you end up, standing around for like three or four hours watching two people drift the whole time and it really doesn't get good until like the last part of the bracket where they're really good and side by side and some tracks are more competitive they do a lot of competitions you look at their track it's all marked there's no fences there's no scenery it's all just you know boxes and clipping points and things that you have to hit and real competitive and that's just not us we we just like to drive and kind of you know run trains and you know relax what are some last notes you'd like to share with anyone thinking about starting any kind of a business um you know when you're starting a business i, I had a, a guy that um when i first started a business uh was kind of coaching me and telling me some stuff and he said, uh, you know, we're the crazy ones, you know, um, people that don't want to go to a, you know, 40 hour a week job and clock in and, you know, listen to a manager, tell them what to do or whatever, you know, they, uh, and, and you know, everybody will tell you you're crazy. Um, they'll, they'll say, uh, it'll never work. You know, they'll, they'll try to, um, just don't listen to them. Don't let them tell you that, you know, uh, your idea for uh, whatever it is that you like doing in your own time, you know, 
someone else out there would like to do that with you and would even pay you to help them get the stuff to do it and pay you to have a place to do it where everybody else is there that likes to do it too. So, uh, but uh, people are going to tell you, you know, and sometimes it'll be, you know, your, your wife or your girlfriend, someone that your mom or your dad mm -hmm. say that'll never work. Stop wasting your time on that. And, uh, you know, if, if you have to maintain a job in the meantime while you're doing it, you know, and uh, and still try to grow it and build it, just don't listen to them. Just keep going because, uh, like like my friend told me, we're the crazy ones, you know, we're the ones that, that actually, uh, everybody says you're crazy for trying to do it, you know, and, and we do it, you know, and then they're stuck, you know, still in the uh, in the norm that they've, they've been in, they've told you to stay in, you know. So uh, it's, a, it's a fun journey. And uh, honestly, uh, most, so I, I hear entrepreneurs say that like having a, a, a business fail is like a badge of honor, you know, like the more businesses you have fail, the better, you, better off you are, you know? And um, so just cause one business fails, don't give up on having a business. And, and even, you know, don't give up on maybe you need to take a different approach to the business, you know? I mean, uh, like I said, when we came back after COVID, COVID actually helped hobbies a lot. Like people got into hobbies when they were home and couldn't do anything. Um, so it actually, the RC Drift hobby grew a lot during COVID. It did, it did a lot for a lot of hobbies. Um, and I know it sounds horrible to say, no, you know, mean, people but have to do something to occupy the it time. It forced people to live differently right. and, and people were, uh, were they adapted uh, in that kind of way. Yeah. And people were stuck at home and, and had to figure out what to do with their time and fidget. And, um, so it really helped the hobby. So maybe if your business doesn't work the first time, you can open the same business, just kind of fall back and regroup and maybe rebrand, have a different name, a different approach, add something to it, do it differently, um, or, or go a totally different route with a totally different business. Um, but don't give up on trying to start a business because, uh, something's got to work, you know, and, and just as long as you're passionate about it, people pick up on your passion. And, uh, sometimes you can convince other people to be passionate about it, right. you know, uh, or, or people can see how much fun you're having and, and want to, come have fun with you and have that much fun as well, you know? So okay. uh, don't give up, you know, keep, keep, uh, keep your passions up and, and, uh, figure out a way to make it work. Don't say no, you know, don't let just persevere. Uh, one door closes, another one opens, you know, just keep, yeah. keep going at it, stay on top of it. Well, Steven, I appreciate you coming on this channel and sharing Thank your story you. and I love your business. And I, I really think that, the big problem you're going to have soon is you need a bigger space. Good problem to have. It is a good Well, thanks a lot. Man. The biggest takeaway Stephen shared with us is the fact that we entrepreneurs, we're the crazy ones. We still continue on our entrepreneurial path regardless of what all the people tell us. They say it won't work. There's no way. That is the craziest idea I've ever heard. You're going to quit your job and do what? Don't listen to them. 99% of the people do what everyone else is doing and take a look at them. So you're not like them. You're crazy. I hope this video added value and you enjoyed it. I'm Curtis Mulberg. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.